Okay, everybody happy? Recording is on. Okay. Just one second, sorry. Are you seeing my screen or not? You're not. You're not. Yes, sir. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Now you, you can see my screen now? Yes, sir. Yes. Hold on. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to another session uh, of our wonderful discussion. Uh, Just one second. Sorry, guys. Okay, so I connected my wrong camera. Okay, so it's a very, very basic topic. Uh, we're going to discuss this because this appears in the exam uh, very often and a lot of you keep getting asked questions about it, okay? So first and foremost is let's describe what is hemoptysis, okay? It's quite important because there is a difference between hemoptysis and hematemesis. So start off first with the definition of hemoptysis. Uh, very simple, uh, you cough up blood or blood stain stools as the blood stain sputum. These are the two things that you have to mention whenever you start discussing hemoptysis. And the blood can come from anywhere. It can come from lungs, it can come from the bronchus, from the trachea or the larynx. Anything that comes uh, infraglottic is actually called as hemoptysis. So this is the one thing that you must remember. Okay? Uh, there are uh, various definitions and uh, the one simplest one, I, I've researched it quite a lot. This is the simplest definition, uh, mild, moderate, severe, and uh, exsanguinated, okay? So mild is less than 30 ml per 24 hours. So if you're asked in the exam anytime, what is, you know, a patient says streaking of blood, that's mild, okay? Uh, moderate is uh, traditionally defined as 30 to 50 ml per hour, okay? Uh, what's happening? The camera is... Yeah. And then you have severe in severe there are two types okay one is massive and one is exsanguinated so massive is more than 600 ml over 24 hours and exsanguinating is more than 150 ml an hour or 3 to 400 ml every episode okay so this is quite important this definition please look into it mild again i'll go over this because when we talk clinically with each other we must understand what is what is the terminology and what are the volumes involved so mild is less than 30 ml uh, per day. Uh, moderate is 30 to 50 ml per day. Per day is important. Uh, and massive is more than 600 ml per day or more than 150 ml per hour. And every episode is at least three to 400 ml. Okay, so this is something that you have to know. And one thing you must remember is uh, 150 ml of blood is enough to cause loss of air exchange, which essentially means that the patient can drown. Uh, people, when they die of hemoptysis, they don't die of volume loss. Most of the times they die of hemoptysis because the blood goes into the opposite side and restricts gas exchange. So you get what is called as typically a respiratory arrest or the concept of drowning. So you drown within your own blood. And that is the important thing. And that is important to understand because management actually focuses on that. Management focuses on isolating the blood to one side or to one lobe to make sure that the other lobe is not uh, cross-infected and to make sure that at least oxygenation is maintained. This philosophy is very important. You must understand this philosophy. 
So starting blood is not the answer for these people. You know, your movement should be, uh, or your reaction to massive hemoptysis should be, that I want to isolate the blood to one side. That is the important thing. So that could mean you could just turn the patient on the side, or you could suppress the cough and things like that. So it's very important to understand this philosophy. Okay. So what is the etiology? It's quite interesting to uh, look at the etiologies of hemoptysis, and, and it's got a wide variety of etiology. In our country, the commonest cause is, of course, tuberculosis. So anybody writes in the exam, uh, particularly the MCH or the TNB guys, uh, the first answer should be etiology. Okay. The second common cause of hemoptysis is actually lung cancer. And then pneumonia. Pneumonia, very commonly, may actually rupture a artery or a, or a vein and will cause that. And the other cause, a common cause, which we see is a pulmonary abscess. So the liquefaction and the necrosis that follows a bacterial inflammation of the lung, unfortunately also affects the vascularity of the lung. And one of those blood vessels might actually rupture and cause a, uh, cause a hemoptysis. Usually they give uh, something called as warning signs. So whenever you're about to get a life-threatening hemoptysis, you will always get a little warning sign. So a little bit of blood will start appearing, maybe 24, 40 hours before, maybe a few hours before. And then suddenly it will rupture and you'll get this massive hemoptysis. So do not ignore the sign of hemoptysis. Very, very often, even if it is a mild hemoptysis, do not ignore the sign of hemoptysis. It could be the calm before the storm. That is very important to understand. Okay? So anytime anybody comes with hemoptysis, you must take it seriously. You should not, uh, you know, say that, okay, this is it. Just send the patient away. All right. The other causes of hemoptysis are aspergilloma, cystic fibrosis, uh, bronchiectasis, uh, very common in our country post-inflammatory diseases uh, you, or post-changes uh, uh, secondary to uh, smoking or uh, tuberculosis or other respiratory infections, you get a bronchiectatic change in the airway, uh, which results in uh, uh, tortuous and engorgement of the bronchial arteries, and they may actually rupture. Okay, so it's quite important. Uh, other causes around the world are sarcoidosis. Uh, there is a possibility of mucormycosis, which is a fungal infection frequently seen in the US. A septic emboli may come and cause a um, uh, obstruction and then subsequent coagulative necrosis may actually rupture the bronchial artery, which is supplying that air. And rarer causes, these are not common causes, but hydrated cyst uh, is mentioned in the group of uh, causes, uh, but not uh, so common. Hydrated cyst uh, does not present with hemoptysis as the first uh, cause. Uh, and pulmonary sequestration, which could be an incidental uh, congenital malformation. Uh, inter interstitial lung disease is again uh, pretty common in our part of the world, and that can feature as, as a cause of hemoptysis. Uh, broncholithiasis, uh, secondary to inflammatory diseases, formation of uh, small stones, which actually can then erode into the bronchial vessels and then cause uh, hemoptysis. There are cardiac causes of uh, hemoptysis, uh, mitral stenosis, because of the calcification and uh, because of the uh, stenosis itself, there can be back pressure changes. As a result of back pressure changes, there can be a uh, and there can be uh, increased pressure in the pulmonary vascular bed. Uh, so there will be increased pressure in the pulmonary capillaries, and the back pressure will be reflected on the pulmonary veins. And often in mitral stenosis, the bleeding comes from the pulmonary vein rather than the pulmonary artery. So this is something to remember. So cardiac causes because of back pressure usually represent as a venous bleed from the uh, pulmonary circulation. Uh, of course, trauma can feature anywhere. Uh, any trauma could be small or big, and that can present as uh, hemoptysis. And coagulopathy, don't forget coagulopathy, because many often, a lot of people these days are taking aspirin, clopidogrel, or, or have got liver diseases. So very often, liver diseases cause uh, uh, disruption of the coagulation cascade 
and as a result of the disruption of the coagulation cascade you may actually end up with a bleed intrapulmonary bleed which will represent itself as a hemoptysis so these are the common causes that you need to remember uh, another cause which we in the medical practice come along is hydrogenic cause uh, doctors or uh, other uh, uh, entities causing the cause uh, tracheostomy tracheostomy can actually cause a massive hemoptysis because you have actually a the act of making a hole in the trachea might injure some vessel and the blood may slowly trickle into the airway and then get coughed out or the presence of a long term tracheostomy tube with the high pressure cuff the key to any uh, good tube is that it should be uh, high volume low pressure or low volume low pressure okay because high pressure cuffs uh, when they compress the mucosa they have a tendency to cause uh, ischemic necrosis and that ischemic necrosis will then subsequently cause a blood vessel to rupture uh, tracheo-innominate fistulas are seen following tracheostomies uh, can be seen after stent insertions uh, they were particularly common when in the era when we were using metallic stents as tracheal stents the metallic stents will erode through the trachea and the structure in front of it is the innominate uh, artery and that will that could get uh, ruptured and so tracheo innominate fistulas are, are are sudden massive hemorrhage of bright red blood is a bad sign okay? that usually tells you that there is something wrong here. uh pa catheters in pa catheter injuries are are known to happen uh, they can happen uh, for a number of causes. One is, of course, the process of inserting a PA catheter. If it is a inexperienced uh, uh, junior who's fiddling around with a PA catheter, he might not know how to manipulate the catheter to float through the, through the arterial system and actually can puncture the pulmonary artery. Uh, he, it, the other way it can cause a bleed is by puncturing the parenchyma. Uh, so going through the artery, arterial supply into the parenchyma. Or, and the third way it can uh, cause the bleeding is if you keep the balloon inflated. Uh, that's not a good idea. When you are uh, using PA catheters and swan gans catheters, you inflate the balloon only when you, are, when you need to measure the cardiac output. That is the philosophy that we tell uh, people. So because the balloon... If you keep it inflated uh, while the patient is in the ICU, if somebody forgets to deflate the balloon, then there will be ischemic necrosis of the blood vessel wall uh, wherever your balloon has got wedged in. Usually it gets wedged into the smaller uh, vessels. And as a result of that, uh, you can actually get, uh, you can get uh, bleed, okay? Uh, the next uh, mechanism of injury is percutaneous lung biopsies. Uh, people putting needles into the, into the lungs uh, can actually precipitate as uh, hemoptysis, but usually these are not massive hemoptysis. They are mild hemoptysis, usually self-limiting. And the patient, uh, you don't really need to aggressively treat anything else. Uh, so, uh, But I have had one case where uh, the radiologist was trying to do a lung biopsy I uh, was trying to do, I think, a liver biopsy, if I'm not mistaken. And for some reason, he went into the, uh, across the diaphragm, into the lung. And, uh, and this patient actually, uh, we don't know what, uh, what bleeding he caused, but uh, he presented with complete, uh, uh, complete uh, hemothorax and then hemoptysis. And then the patient acutely crashed in the radiology room. And I had to open up the chest and uh, try to salvage the patient. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we did what we had to do, but uh, we lost the patient. So these percutaneous procedures are not without their mortality. You've got to be very, very, very careful. Uh, and of course, transbronchial uh, biopsies. So 5 to 10% of procedures of percutaneous lung biopsy will present with hemoptysis, and 2% of transbronchial uh, biopsies will present as uh, massive or hemoptysis. Uh, the important thing in transbronchial is nowadays in the current scenario, you must use EBUS. Ultrasound gives you a good idea of where you are to make sure that your needle doesn't accidentally uh, get into a blood vessel and cause a massive bleed. 
that is very important to understand. So transbronchial biopsies to do it blindly is almost not justified in the current era. Uh, bronchovascular fistulas uh, can happen. You can actually get bleed uh, from uh, the blood vessel close to the anastomosis that you've done. So sleeve resections uh, uh, can actually have this problem. Uh, anastomotic insufficiency when you've done a sleeve resection. So there is tension on the on the uh, area that you've sutured and uh, the, the blood vessel suddenly opens into the airway. And that's a complete, complete disaster. Can happen secondly to infection. Uh, so whenever you do sleeve resections, you've got to be very careful about uh, making sure that you anastomose correct and you don't have any issues uh, with your anastomosis. But the treatment of something like this is very, very radical. It's almost life-saving. You've got to get in there and very often you might actually end up with a completion hemorrhage. So this is all from literature. I've looked up all the cases that are there and this has been reported following a bronchi bronchovascular sleeve resection. Uh, there is a report, case report of iotobronchial fistula following lung transplant. So uh, this is also something that you've got to be very careful about. And this is reported from literature. There is another very nice uh, paper on left subclavian artery aneurysm eroding through the lung. It erodes through the lung into the, uh, into the parenchyma and suddenly you've got a massive bleed into the lung. And you don't even know that the bleed is actually extra parenchyma. The pathology is extra parenchyma until and unless you have done some imaging before. Uh, iota bronchial fistulas are known to happen following aortic aneurysms. So there is a lot of structures in that area. And so whenever you get hemoptysis, the history and clinical findings and basic radiology is extremely important because it will help guide you towards uh, any of the other pathologies that are present. You can get bronchial artery aneurysms, secondary to bronchiectasis, uh, secondary to osler weber rendu syndrome, which is a syndrome of pulmonary hemangiomas, uh, AV malformations, and uh, secondary to any mediastinal or inflammatory uh, pathology. Uh, the, the bronchial artery can go into, a, can become aneurysm. So these are the sort of things that you need to remember. Uh, it's a very large list. But I've tried to break them down into various segments so that you understand whenever you're trying to reproduce this in the exam. I want to make sure that you very clearly, uh, you know, line up all the causes. Okay. Now, uh, whenever you're doing discussions in the exam, it's very nice to be able to talk about some syndromes. So I'll just throw these names at you. You don't need to know any of these in detail, but sometimes in an MCQ, you might get uh, a question asked. This is for the MCQ actually. And so they will throw a few fancy names, syndrome names, and you have to pick one. So the common syndromes which are associated with hemoptysis, I'll just put it out here, okay? So the common syndrome that are associated with hemoptysis is osler weber rendu syndrome. Some people call it rendu osler weber syndrome. It doesn't matter. It, it depends on which paper you're reading. But osler weber rendu syndrome is, uh, is one cause. Uh, where I told you there are congenital uh, AVMs, uh, Bechet's disease, uh, use Stoven syndrome. These are all vasculitis syndromes. So all these are vasculitis diseases. Uh, Takayasu's disease causing arterial vasculitis. Any of these can actually cause hemoptysis. Eisenmenger's and uh, Eisenmenger's with the associated mitral pathology and Wegener's granulomatosis. All of these can actually cause uh, hemoptysis. So this slide, for, is only for the exam going. I do not expect you to know details of any of these syndromes, but just take a snapshot of the screen to keep this slide because uh, I have seen an, an MCQ in the FRCS where they gave five uh, syndromes and you had to pick up one. So it, it's, it's good to know uh, which are the, uh, which are the uh, disease which can cause hemoptysis. So particularly for the exam going, just take a snapshot of this, uh, take a screenshot of this uh, a slide so you will then remember these so anytime there's an association uh, uh, asked in the exam you'll be able to say it okay uh, commonest uh, uh, cause is infection we know that we say that and uh, usually short lived it's not a it's not a big problem it doesn't go on to become a big issue until and unless it becomes a chronic inflammatory disease so acute infections usually don't cause it 
looking at the literature, uh, it has been reported 7.5% for lung cancer in men can present with hemoptysis as a prime uh, etiology and 4.3% for lung cancers in women. Again, these numbers, I'm putting it out to you because this actually features in one of the FRCS MCQs. So just for you to remember. Uh, and uh, the moment uh, they become older, Older patients have more risk of uh, hemoptysis, and that is something that you must remember. So older the patient, uh, more frail is the vascularity, and so more likely that a tumor will invade into the blood vessel and present as primary hemoptysis. Uh, so this is the uh, logic behind that, okay? So let's look at what are the source of T. So far, we've just spoken about etiology. Again, I spread the whole etiology into multiple slides because I want you to understand the various pathologies. So now look at what can bleed, you know? Yes, the bleeding is happening. Yes, you're seeing the blood in the, space, uh, in the sputum, but where is it coming from? So the commonest cause of hemoptysis is systemic bronchial arteries. 90 to 95% of all bleeding that happens within the parenchyma is because the bronchial artery gets eroded, okay? So almost 95% of this bleeding is secondary to systemic bronchial artery bleeding. Okay, bronchial arteries are systemic. They arise from the aorta. So that's why you need to remember that. Uh, the non-bronchial bleeding that happens is usually because of collateralization. Any pathology which causes obstruction and causes collateralization can also cause the bleeding. The collateralization that can cause hemoptysis can occur from collateralization through the internal thoracic through the subclavian, through the axillary, or through the intercostal. Any of this can erode into the lung uh, parenchyma and subsequently cause the problem. So that's the second source of bleeding. So first is bronchial artery. Second is collaterals. Okay, you have to remember this when we are discussing in the exam. Uh, pulmonary artery circulation can cause uh, uh, hemoptysis, uh, usually between 5 to 10%. So not so common for a pulmonary artery to bleed. It's more common for a bronchial artery to Okay, and then you have these pathologies of pulmonary artery, Rasmussen's aneurysm, erosion due to lung cancer, AV malformation. Uh, can I request everybody to just switch off your microphone, please? I don't know whose is on, but uh, just switch off your microphone, whoever is there, please. Uh, because I'm wearing uh, AirPods, it, it really rings in my ears. So uh, AV, AV malformation, uh, and then, uh, Major iotopulmonary collaterals, as they are called as MAPCA, okay, and uh, single ventricle failing fontan circulation. Any of these can cause uh, bleed within the lung parenchyma. So this is this is how we we classify the source of bleed. Okay? It's quite important to understand the source of bleed. Yeah. So let's move on to the next part of the talk. Uh, clinical features. We all know the clinical features. They are very easy. Patient comes with coughing blood, he may present with fever, malaise, weight loss, clubbing. Uh, depending on whatever is the pathology and whatever is the underlying cause, the clinical features will depend. So that's why a history taking is very important. It's very important to take a good detailed history, understand what is the probable pathology that is causing the hemoptysis in the patient. But whenever you get hemoptysis, you must be wary that you are not dealing with hematemesis. It's quite important to understand the difference between hemoptysis and hematemesis. Uh, also remember there's a concept of pseudohemoptysis, which comes from the oropharyngeal area, uh, usually secondary to ENT bleed or oropharyngeal bleed, uh, and epistaxis. Sometimes, you know, the patient is actually having epistaxis, but after a little while, little bit of blood remains back in the oropharyngeal, and he coughs and the blood comes up. So it's important to differentiate whether the bleed, the bleed has come below the vocal cords or above the vocal cords. So history is very important. The history will actually give you quite a good idea of whether this is a pseudo hemoptysis or it's actual hemoptysis, okay? So uh, whenever you see a patient with hemoptysis, don't forget to examine the oropharyngeal cavity or get an ENT surgeon to examine the oropharyngeal cavity just to make sure that you're not missing some cause in the oropharyngeal rather than trying to look down deeper into it. So this is the chart, this is the table. It's a very nice table, beautifully represents, uh, uh, again, uh, oh, sorry, one minute, I have to stop whoever is talking. I don't know who it is. Kadyan Babu, switch off your. Okay, 
So this is a very standard table. You must know this. We ask this question frequently in the exam. Okay, frequently in the exam, I have seen this being brought up. How do you know it, it, it isn't hematemesis? Okay, so you have got to say these. So the color usually hemoptysis is bright red. Hematemesis will be dark red. The pH, if you take of an hemoptysis, will be alkaline. As opposed to that, the pH of hematemesis is usually acidic because gastric contents may be involved in that. And usually the uh, pH of the GI tract uh, uh, gastroesophageal area is all acidic. Uh, the appearance is important. The appearance usually is frothy because it comes with the airways and there is a lot of churning of the blood. Usually the hemoptysis appears frothy. When you look at hematemesis, it just comes as one go. You vomit and it's, it's not frothy. The appearance is usually not frothy. Uh, again, the symptom is important. Uh, so usually hemoptysis is preceded by cough. Patient will tell you that I coughed and I, the blood came out. Uh, hematemesis, the patient will tell you, I actually vomited, I had nausea. But sometimes it's very difficult to understand the difference. Some patients are very confusing because they may have both and they're not able to tell you exactly whether, you know, was it cough or was it vomiting? So it's very important to sit down with the patient and try to distinguish between the two. And of course, the history of respiratory illness versus an upper GI history will help. So this answer we want from you in the exam. Whenever I'm dealing uh, with a long case of uh, hemoptysis, I usually ask this question. So it is important. So uh, this table, uh, please keep in mind, it will actually help you to differentiate between hemoptysis and hematemesis. Uh, don't raise your hands. I, I, I can't help you just now. All right, so what do we look for in the chest X-ray? Surprising thing is, uh, Dr. Manikala, is this something urgent? You're raising a hand. I, I don't know how to help you at this stage. I'm in the middle of the talk. Any, any questions, any queries, please keep it to the end of the talk, okay? All right, so when you look at chest X-rays, 20 to 40% of these chest X-rays may actually be normal. You may not find anything on a chest X-ray because it might be just a, you know, distal uh, parenchymal bleed, which may or may not show up on a chest x uh, Sometimes if you do find a pathology, it's quite obvious. You can see an area which will tell you where the pathology is. So in 80% of the patients, you may actually find the pathology. And usually what you will see on a chest x-ray is pulmonary infiltration. That's what you have to look for. And uh, pulmonary infiltration gives you a pretty nice idea of whether you're dealing with the right side or the left side. Very often, the difficulty in hemoptysis is knowing what is bleeding, you know. Uh, and sometimes people have more than one lesions on both the sides. And if we decide surgery or we decide to do a lobectomy, it's very important to know whether the lobe that you're going to do, do is actually bleeding or not. That is very important, okay? Uh, you might see cavitation on a chest X-ray or you might see a mass effect uh, like a lung cancer or something. So these are the sort of things. Uh, this is an aspergilloma. This is one of my patients who came in with acute bleed. And uh, we had to actually go in, uh, you know, the same evening because uh, the, uh, the aspergilloma had eroded into a blood vessel. And he came in with massive bleed. And we really overnight, not even overnight, uh, he, he came in around 10 o'clock or something. Young boy, 17-year-old. Uh, from a very good family, very affluent family, and actually presented with this sort of thing. So you really need to go in quickly and sort out. Uh, sometimes you might get these subtle changes. If you look carefully in the left apex, there is some fluffy infiltration, and also there are some changes in the left face. So the pathology may be in the left apex where the bleed has happened, but very often the bleed trickles down to the dependent area. So you've got to remember this philosophy that the that where you are seeing a collection of blood may not be the pathology, it may just be dependent drainage of the blood into that area. The pathology is actually up here in the upper lobe. So it's very important to understand the difference between uh, the pathology and dependent blood. Uh, 
uh, when you are trying to do, uh, you know, when you're trying to interpret radiology or when you're trying to do bronchoscopy as well. So you, these things can actually mislead you. So here it is very clearly, you can see a streak of bronchitis is happening across here. And I will show you this guy's CT scan at a later stage. So you, you, here you can very clearly see that this pathology is where the bleed probably originates because the rest of the lung looks normal. Uh, hemoptysis uh, CT scan is mandatory. Uh, CT scan may show you pneumonia, it may show you cavitation, it may show you mass, or it may show you bronchitis. So it shows you the actual pathology. So CT scan is pretty sensitive. Uh, the problem is most of the CT scan is done when the hemoptysis is settled. So the source of bleeding becomes a real difficulty, but there are very good clues on CT scan which tell you where the problem is coming from. So this is the CT scan of the young boy, which I told you about. And there is the whole pocket of aspergillosis, uh, which has actually eroded. If you look medially, it's very close to these segmental uh, blood vessels. And when something like this ruptures, you really get a massive gush. And they present with massive hemoptysis rather than uh, mild or moderate. Again, here you can see the changes in pulmonary infiltration. This is from Khalil's paper. Uh, so there is uh, changes in the lingula. Uh, there is also changes in the right lower, uh, in the left lower lobe, and you can see uh, a diffuse change with multiple ground glass opacities, suggestive of some sort of a inflammatory pathology happening in the left lower lobe. Again, here you can see very clearly this area. I've put that asterisk there to highlight. Uh, the pathology and, and you can clearly make out there is some problem in the left upper lobe that's causing this problem. And this is the patient with the atelectasis I showed you, uh, bronchiectasis. And you can see that it's coming very, it's a very central pattern of distribution and it's very close to the blood vessels. Usually one of these blood vessels are the ones which might actually rupture or usually it might be a bronchial artery which will rupture and then you will have to go in and embolize the artery. Necrotizing uh, pneumonia can cause pseudoaneurysm. So this is pneumonia, and uh, necrotizing about to become a lung abscess. And if you look at the angiographic phase of the study, you can actually see a blood vessel going through, the, uh, through that area. And usually this is the one which will bleed and cause you massive hemoptysis. So you gotta be very careful. When you see a CT like this, you really need to be aware that this patient is a ticking time bomb. Okay, pulmonary infiltrations, you'll see this is post tuberculosis. So this is a tuberculous cavity, complete destruction of the left upper lobe, and there is uh, lots of areas which will give you trouble. So it, it helps you to uh, identify what you do. So this is the uh, philosophy of CT scan in uh, multi-detector CT and geography. This is a well-documented uh, paper where they talk about how to go about angiographically uh, managing a, a hemoptysis. So they, they clearly lay it out. You do the CT angiogram. And then when you do the CT angiogram, you, if, you, I, if you're able to identify the bleeding site, uh, then you, you go down into the PA embolization, uh, sorry, into the embolization of the bronchial artery. So if you see the bleeding vessels and there are signs of PA involvement, then you do what is called as a PA embolization. If there is no sign of PA involvement, then you do embolization of the bronchial arteries, okay? And the way they map the bronchial arteries is uh, they do a MIP uh, in uh, three planes and a volume rendering technique, uh, at least 10 to 30 mm, frontal and sagittal planes. These are the uh, uh, requirements for a good CT angiogram to pick up bronchial pathologies, okay? So MIP of five to 10 mm in three planes. You have to do it in three planes and you got to do a volume rendering in of about 10 to 30 mm frontal and sagittal. I, I ask this question sometimes in the exam. So when you're doing a CT angiogram, what are the instructions you would give to the, to the radiologist? So these are the two instructions when they are actually analyzing the CT. Okay, so it's important. This point actually appears also in, in an MCQ. Okay, so it's quite important. All right, so let's look at bronchial artery and geography. Uh, so you go through the retrograde femoral cannulation, you cannulate it, and you go up and you inject the dye. The key thing is that you should do this when the patient is having active bleeding. 
if the patient doesn't have active bleeding, it's very difficult to actually isolate this extravasation. It's almost impossible to pick up the extravasation. So most of the times when the patient presents with hem uh, hemoptysis, very quickly get on to the radiologist. And if you know that this is a severe hemoptysis, try to at least map the bronchial artery. You will do a CT scan. But before you do any of this, of course, you have to stabilize the patient. I'll talk about that. So you have to stabilize the patient, but very quickly think about doing a CT scan and think about doing a CT angiogram. Because really, the positivity of a CT angiogram comes when there is extravasation. And uh, there will be a highlight of the contrast. But this will happen only if the patient is actively bleeding. And that will tell you where is the bleeding vessel. So this is uh, this is the way it looks like. So they go in from the pulmonary, uh, from the femoral artery all the way to the top and they've highlighted this and you can see this blush. The key thing is this blush. This blush actually tells you that the bleeding is from this area. And if you look carefully within the blush, there are two or three areas where the arteries are enlarged and these are the source of your bleed. Uh, nowadays with the technology, it is actually possible to do a 3D reconstruction. So when you do the CT scans, always tell them to do a 3D uh, 3D angiography reconstruction. It's important. It's a different uh, mode on the on the uh, on the console. So it's not reconstruction of the of the of the lung parenchyma. It's actually reconstruction of the vascularity of the parenchyma. So the capture is slightly different when you do that. And if you look carefully, there is a small aneurysm here uh, within the uh, pulmonary vascularity. This is the cause of the bleed. And this one is, is a bronchial artery. So there are two different types of source, two different sources for bleeding. So here is the bronchial artery, which is probably going to be bleeding. And this is a aneurysmal uh, pulmonary artery. So it's something else is going on in this patient. Okay. Is it clear so far? Hello? Yes, sir. 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 Oh, yeah. Okay, that's fine. All of the slides, all, all of the slides have been organized in a way that they will answer a specific question in the exam. Okay, so when you go back and revise this lecture, everything that's on the top of the of that slide, like this, is is the question. So what do you see in a bronchial artery and geography? Okay, and so all the slides have been arranged as question and answers. So I want you to understand this. So this particular talk, I have specifically designed it only for exam purposes, okay? So let's look at hemoptysis management, all right? It's quite important. This is very, very important, this discussion. So uh, this is the management in literature for uh, deciding whether you want to do uh, bronchial artery embolization or continue medical treatment, okay? So this is a different, uh, this is the first protocol. We're not reached surgical protocol. This is the first protocol. So usually the medical team will be looking after the patient. They will make sure that they've got enough uh, clinical data, chest x-ray, the uh, CT scan and geography has been done, plus minus bronchoscopy. Bronchoscopy plays an important role in the management of, uh, of uh, uh, hemoptysis. So when we talk about it, the order is first history taking, a very good clinical examination, resuscitation of the patient that is the order resuscitation of the patient before you go for any investigation you must resuscitate the patient either with fluids or whatever else you need to do and then you talk about investigations okay don't just jump to take the patient to a ct scanner because if it's an acutely unwell patient you should not jump to ct scan first so then depending upon this whether the patient is in acute respiratory failure or not if he's in acute respiratory failure and you need to urgently stop the bleeding then a bronchial artery embolization or a pulmonary artery uh, vaso occlusive uh, procedure is indicated if it's a main PLS uh, lesion, then surgery is also included as part of the thing. Then depending upon the flow, depending upon the flow of the hemoptysis, if it's very small flow, then you just do symptomatic treatment. If it is mediocre flow, then you watch the patient. So moderate hemoptysis, you, you analyze the patient. And if it gets to uh, a situation where you think you have the expertise available, then jump into BAE. Okay, that's quite important or you can manage them symptomatically. And I'll talk about each one of this in more detail. So don't worry. This is just a flash to show you 
how the management works. So each situation I'm actually now going to talk in more details from an exam point of view. But this is from the journals and literature. So I just brought this up. So let's look at the management of mild hemoptysis. Okay? Uh, so let me just bring this picture here. So let's look at the management of mild hemoptysis. Okay. Always, always with mild hemoptysis, the pathology, the philosophy treat the underlying cause. You don't have to worry about the hemoptysis. That's not going to kill the patient. But so the treatment is focused more on treating the underlying cause. So, you know, somebody with less than 30 ml over 24 hours, you don't need to do resuscitation in this patient. So oral antibiotics, depending upon whatever is the pathophysiology, it could be uh, it could be infection, uh, it could be something else. Uh, smoking cessation must part form of your answer, particularly when you are uh, speaking in 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 the international examinations. So oh, smoking cessation is actually part of the recommended uh, managements. So besides treating the underlying cause, don't forget to mention smoking cessation as a part of management of mild hemoptysis. CT scan and bronchoscopy is done if the patient is not settling down or there are repeated episodes or uh, if it is more than 30 ml per day or if there is suspected bronchiectasis from the history or there is persistent bleeding in a smoker. So this question is asked very often that would you jump into a CT scan in everybody? Uh, usually yes in nowadays, but uh, the indication is that uh, uh, if these, any of these is uh, fulfilled, then you can jump into a CT scan. And, and bronchoscopy is asked, would you do a bronchoscopy in all people coming with uh, uh, mild hemoptysis? Uh, so this is the answer that if there is no resolution of symptoms, after having given adequate antibiotics uh, and the patient is still having repeated episodes, uh, if the bleeding has jumped to more than 30 ml per day, if there is some evidence of bronchiectasis or persistent bleeding in a smoker or some lesion found on a, on a chest X-ray. Because most of the times with mild hemoptysis, you will start off with the chest X-ray and stick there. All right, let's look at moderate hemoptysis. Again, this is another question in the exam, okay? So I've put it in question-wise. So whenever you're talking about moderate hemoptysis, more than uh, 50 to 200 ml per day, I would recommend hospital admission. This is the recommendation which comes from the guideline. Uh, sorry, there are no guidelines. This comes from the literature. So hospital admission, uh, admission is mandatory. Cardiovascular and respiratory observation is needed. The reason why they say this is because a moderate hemoptysis might be a precursor for a massive hemoptysis. So be very careful because massive hemoptysis or exsanguinating hemoptysis may not give you time to save the patient. So it's better to have the patient in a hospital environment and keep him under respiratory monitoring and keep him under hemoglobin monitoring. Of course, you you jump in and uh, you jump in and do the investigations, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. So the philosophy, the philosophy of management of of hemoptysis is prevent aspiration, stop the bleeding, and definitive treatment to prevent recurrence. Okay, these are the three philosophies. These are the words I want to hear from you when we discuss management of massive hemoptysis. Prevent aspiration, which means you do not want the normal side to be affected. And then you talk about stopping him. And don't just jump into endobronchial therapies and stuff like that. You actually, first and foremost, is you've got to make sure that you take care of the patient. The ABC has to be taken care of first. Okay? So let's look at the conservative management of this patient. Usually get them into HDU or ICU. Uh, important, don't keep them lying around in the ward. You will lose the patient if they are not monitored adequately. Resuscitate the patient. Resuscitate the patient. Airway, breathing, circulation. You have to make sure. If this guy needs to be intubated, so be it to maintain the airway. But resuscitate the patient. Okay. Always position him with the bleeding side down. So it is a lateral position or a semi fowlless position. Cough medication to suppress any major cough uh, issues. Broad spectrum IV antibiotics, if you know there is an obvious pathology, uh, obvious infective pathology, then broad spectrum IV antibiotics. Supplement oxygen, very important. IV access, a large bore IV access, very important, okay? For fluid resuscitation or blood transfusion, usually our cutoff, uh, particularly in the Western world, is seven. 
you don't transfuse till uh, the Hb is below 7. And of course, then once you've done the resuscitation, you go into CT scan and bronchoscopy. That's the next step. Okay. So again, I'm going to repeat this because this is quite important. So always, if you ask, how do you manage a massive hemoptysis, I get the patient into ECU, ICU, start the resuscitation, airway, breathing, circulation, position the patient, bleeding side down, uh, give some cough suppressant if required, broad spectrum IV antibiotics if I'm thinking of infection, supplement oxygen for these patients, they will need that. IV access, broad spectrum to Venflons or whatever. If you think you need to catheterize, you catheterize the patient, uh, you know, for monitoring purpose. And then you take the patient to a CT scan. Okay. So that's the order of things. Don't just say, I will do a CT scan straight away. That is, that is a disaster statement. Because if you say, I will do CT scan straight away, then you do not understand the principles of... Uh, of uh, ACLS and BCLS, okay? So the first is always resuscitate the patient. In the exam, we watch for this one very, very carefully, okay? So let's look at the intervention, interventions that are available. So you've done your CT scans and you're going to do a bronchoscopy. Endobronchial, once you're there with the bronchoscopy, you can do a washout with cold saline, a huge cold saline washout and good suctioning may actually get controlled by causing vasospasm. Or you can add uh, adrenaline into the into the uh, solution that you are going to make. So large amount of saline, add uh, uh, adrenaline. But remember, it has got to be supra diluted. So normally, uh, we we add just two or three drops of adrenaline in 100 ml of uh, sorry in one liter of the saline solution uh, of one in 100,000. So we really make it very dilute because adrenaline is absorbed transmucosally. The bronchial mucosa absorbs adrenaline really quickly. And if somebody's got a compromised cardiac function, you might actually uh, cause, uh, uh, cardio, cause cardio collapse for this patient. So be very careful when you're using cold saline and adrenaline solution. Uh, endobronchial blockers may be used uh, for main stem uh, area. So you just block the side to get, uh, stays, uh, get control of the situation. Uh, or if you think that you're able to go further beyond with the bronchoscopy and suctioning, and you can see that actually the bleeding is coming from a segmental bronchus or a lobar bronchus, you can either put in a blocker or you can put in a Fogarty scatter. These are temporizing measures, okay? You are trying to stabilize the patient and you're trying to just get control of the situation. And more importantly, you're trying to stop the uh, soiling of the normal side. That is the important thing, okay? Uh, if you've done this, and if you think that the patient is uh, stable and doesn't need uh, further intervention, then you can speak to your radiology colleague and you can consider bronchial artery embolization, okay? So bronchial artery embolization is, is uh, slightly later down the road. A little earlier than doing bronchial artery embolization is starting them on pharmacological therapy like transanamic acid. So you have to give them transanamic acid to get control of the bleeding. The other pharmacological agents available are octreotide or vasopressin. Uh, sometimes, rarely, radiotherapy has been recommended. And I'll talk about this a bit later when I'm talking about the flowchart of the management. And then last but not the least, surgery is one of the management techniques. So out here, I am actually highlighting all the various techniques that you've got for managing the bleeding, for preventing the soiling of the normal lung, and then getting into actual treatment of whatever is the bleed, the cause of the bleed. So this is the uh, philosophy that you have to follow. Three philosophies. Resuscitate the patient, isolate the bleeding, which means do not allow the normal lung to be uh, soiled. And number three, then comes stopping the bleeding, okay? So stopping the bleeding is not the first management in uh, hemoptysis. Always, always, the other two precede before you do any of this, okay? So let's talk a little bit about bronchoscopies. You do flexible and rigid bronchoscopies in a massive hemoptysis. Uh, usually in moderate or severe hemoptysis, but usually in moderate hemoptysis, more than 150 ml per hour or 3 to 400 ml per hour. 
So this is an indication for doing bronchoscopy in a patient, okay? In mild hemoptysis, usually you don't uh, need to do broncos bronchoscopy. And most of the times you may actually not even find the pain itself. But when it gets to a more severe situation, you must consider bronchoscopy. Uh, localize the source of bleeding. Suctioning of the blood is pretty difficult usually. Uh, the endobronchial agents that you can use to uh, get control of the situation is endobronchially you can use a solution of transanamic acid. There are at least four or five papers which have actually looked at the use of transanamic acid as an agent for stopping bleeding endobronchially. So this is backed by literature. This is not random. Uh, the other thing that you can use is gel thrombin slurry. This is from a very good study, uh, which has actually looked at the use of gel thrombin slurry. These are, most of these are not randomized studies. Most of these are case series, but from good centers with good uh, intervention bronchoscopy. Uh, you have got the option of silicon spigot just to block off that area. Uh, you have option of airway stenting. Uh, sometimes we have had uh, many case reports, not, uh, series but individual case reports where they have actually put in covered stents into the affected side so that uh, no no blood comes out so for example if you've got the right upper lobe bleeding then to temporize the right upper lobe bleeding you can actually put a right main bronchial uh, covered airway stent into the bronchus intermediates so that will temporarily collapse the right upper lobe and that may stop the bleeding or isolate the bleeding to the right upper lobe. So this is the philosophy behind these endobronchial agents. And this is again published in literature. So everything that I put out here is actually backed by papers. I have personally read each one of these papers. And uh, so I've picked up just the agent that is used. A thrombin or thrombin fibrinogen glue. Uh, again, a series, uh, a pretty good series talking about the use of this. Uh, some people have talked of factor 7a endobronchially. Uh, and surprisingly, it seems to have worked in the group that they have looked at and they've had good uh, outcomes with uh, using recombinant factor 7A in the bronchus. Uh, some people have used oxidized, regenerated cellulose. And there is a youth series uh, which talks about N-butyl cyanoacrylate glue. So these are all the agents that are available for you when you are there with your uh, bronchoscope to stop bleeding, okay? Uh, ND YAG lasers are the ones recommended. If you see an obvious pathology in the airway, uh, the YAG laser is very good for stopping this, uh, uh, for taking care of the uh, hemoptysis. Um, argon plasma coagulation is actually even better because argon plasma coagulation gives you a widespread. We, we discussed this when I did the endobronchial lecture. So APC is a non-touch technique and it, it has a wider spread and it causes, it doesn't go deep into the tissues. It acts superficially within millimeters of the lesion and it can cause a wide area of coagulation. So it's pretty safe. And as I said, APC is used by the liver surgeons for uh, liver to stop the bleeding from the raw surface of the liver. So APC is a very good uh, technology if you're going to use it for hemoptysis in an acute situation. And last but uh, you know, not the least, not used that often, but you do have endobronchial electrocautery, which might help you to uh, burn off some localized lesions which are actively bleeding. So these three, the last three, are, are used when you actually see a lesion not when the bleeding is from the parenchyma or something. So when you see an endobronchial lesion, that is when you have the option of using any of these. Another one, which I think I forgot to mention in the slide, is to use cryotherapy. Cryotherapy is also part of the treatment protocols for uh, hemoptysis as an endobronchial intervention technique for uh, stopping hemoptysis from specific lesions. So in these situations, you have to see the lesion, okay? All right. Rigid bronchoscopy, usually done in massive bleeding, you must have jet encephalation, very, very important. But remember that whenever you're doing a jet encephalation, uh, you, you must not, you must suction before you blow. 
this is very important when you're doing rigid blockage. The problem with the using jet encephalation before you suction is that you drive the blood more distally. And so that causes more atelectasis and more infection risk in the tissue. So whenever you use jet encephalation when you're doing rigid bronchoscopy, you always have to clear the airway first before you blow into the lung. But of course, it's a very fine art and it depends on whether the patient is desaturating or not. If he's desaturating, then maintaining oxygenation is more important than controlling the bleeding at that stage. A good endobronchial toilet is mandatory. Before you do anything, you must suck out as much as possible. You must wash out with cold saline. So cold saline wash out allows you to actually visualize. So the vision is quite important when you're doing these things. And of course, topical adrenaline, which I spoke about. And then you can use any of these agents if you see an actual pathology in that area. Uh, endobronchial intubation has a role uh, when you have finished doing whatever you're doing and you want to make sure that you want to maintain the soiling or even before you have done a bronchoscopy if you want to control the vent uh, the soiling of the normal side if you obviously know that the pathology is on the right so you have an option of pushing in a double lumen tube onto the left side so the right is isolated you can block the right side and then continue with ventilating just the left side. Uh, you can use single lumen tube with selective intubation. So a single lumen tube can be passed into the opposite side. But these work when you know which side the cause is. So you really need to be very clear that right is the affected and left is not affected. And then of course you've got the option of bronchial poker through a single uh, lumen tube. Uh, so this is uh, again from a paper about managing hemoptysis. So this is selective endobronchial intubation. So the lung is being, uh, the, the endotracheal tube is pushed into the opposite side so that the affected side, uh, you do whatever you have to do, but at least the opposite side is taken care of. That is the important thing. And you can start transenamic acid and then hope that that side gets sorted. Sort of. The second thing I told you is double lumen intubation. So this is a double lumen intubation. The obvious bleed is on the right side. You know that. You've done your bronchoscopy, you've done your suctioning, and then you place the tube into the left side and take the patient to the ICU to stabilize him afterwards. Uh, bronchial blockers are available. You can put bronchial blockers. Bronchial blockers help. The philosophy with bronchial blockers is they are put onto the side of the problem. In the others that we saw, we are going to the normal side. So in selective endobronchial intubation, you, you are intubating the normal side. In double lumen tube, you are pushing air into the normal side to prevent any uh, blood trickling into the normal side. In a bronchial blocker, you block the, the affected side. So the blocker goes into the affected side and blocks that side so that no blood trickles over. So this philosophy has to be understood. Where to use what is quite important. So uh, here you are actually blocking the affected side. Okay and then bronchoscopy to suction out or whatever else. So these are all the techniques that are available to you when you are managing, um, uh, when you're managing massive hemoptysis. Let's talk about bron bronchial artery embolization. Uh, what is available? Uh, there are various agents that are used when you're going to do hemoptysis. The various agents are polyvinyl alcohol foam. Uh, this can be actually injected up the catheter of the uh, bronchial artery angiogram and, and these are special delivery catheters and they can block the bleeding bronchial vessel. Uh, absorbable gelatin is also available uh, for you. Uh, you. It is another material that is used uh, for BAE. Uh, Giant turco steel coils uh, are, are small uh, steel coils which are engaged within the bronchial artery and you might have to use multiple steel coils to block the bleeding site of the of the artery and uh, the whole aim is to occlude the bleeding artery and geographically okay so you have to as i explained to you earlier how you do this so this here you are here they have injected the uh, they have done a bronchial artery embolization and they have found a flush here and they have seen uh, evidence of bleed in this area so they've gone in and they have actually uh, put in the coils these are the gentaco coils which they have Put. And there are multiple ones used to occlude the whole of that bronchial artery. 
And uh, it's, it's a good enough technique to stabilize a, a bleeding patient. It's a pretty decent technique to stabilize these patients. Again, here they are, they are deploying these coils uh, to get control of that bleeding vessel. Uh, but usually, as I told you, you actually end up putting more than one because it's kind of difficult to know uh, whether it's only one or two arteries. So usually they will, they will try to pinpoint the source and deploy it in as many locations as possible. But these are expensive uh, tools. So every coil that you deploy adds to the cost of the treatment for these patients. Uh, the response rate is reported pretty good, actually, in literature. The response rate, if you look at all the papers which talk about bronchial artery embolization, uh, most of them are published in radiology literature. And uh, most of them are uh, about 90 to 95% uh, uh, you know, immediate uh, control of the bleeding. Uh, usually they have failures because of collateralization. So the moment you block one artery, there is a back pressure and there is collateralization of the, of the vessels. And the moment there is collateralization, then there could be bleeding from another uh, collateral. And so usually these guys who have had a BAE will end up having multiple BAEs or will end up uh, on your uh, surgery table. But it is a good technique to temporize the patient. So if you get a patient who's very sick and you know you see an obvious pathology and he's not fit for surgery, then embolization is a good choice on table uh, to, to take. Uh, and then you temporize the patient, get him fit, uh, give whatever antifungal, anti-tuberculous that you have to do, and then you take him up for a subsequent surgery. So that is a good uh, management philosophy that you can have. So use... Uh, bronchial artery embolization judiciously. Uh, the risk with the bronchial artery is that they have to identify spinal artery. The spinal artery comes off in the same areas and inadvertently if they embolize the spinal artery, there are many reported uh, case uh, literature of paraplegia uh, following from the bronchial artery embolization. So when you are taking consent for these things, uh, this has to be included in the consent, uh, risk of spinal artery embolization. Uh, of course, there's a risk of contrast energy, which is, uh, we know about it, and uh, trauma to the vessel. So rather than solving the problem, they may make the problem worse. They may actually uh, cause more bleeding in the patient. But usually, uh, they are pretty good. And even if they cause trauma to the vessel, they can still block it with the coil. So you need a good uh, interventional radiologist who can actually solve these problems. But usually, as I said, um, when you do these, the first time they respond very well. But if you have to keep repeated, uh, keep doing repeated procedures, the response rate goes down quite dramatically. Uh, so it is it is important that once they have had one procedure, uh, you you really need to think of a more definitive treatment. Uh, you can do a second sitting, you can do a third sitting, but. Once the, the first sitting has worked, then you should think of a more definitive treatment. And the most definitive treatment usually is surgery so that you can take away that lesion which is causing the muscle. Uh, surgery, what are the surgeries that are possible? Uh, there are uh, many uh, surgical approaches. Usually most people, when they're facing with an acute uh, onset hemoptysis having to take to the take the patient to theater will do an open thoracotomy and that's fine there's nothing wrong with that i think you have to be within your zone uh, open thoracotomy is 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 a very very mandatory is a, is a very very sensible option when you're dealing with a patient who's compromised uh, if you happen to be in a center where there is high end uh, VATS available then uh, in in my particular center i would actually go by VATS because I, I am very comfortable in the VATS domain. And more importantly, I can also control, uh, I can also convert to thoracotomy anytime. Uh, a thoracotomy gives you a large bleeding area, and particularly in somebody who's already compromised, has received blood transfusion and things like that. There is more risk of getting wound infections and things in your thoracotomy. So just you have to balance the pros and cons. But the first choice in a young surgeon should we just open the chest sort the problem. Access is not the main thing. Solving the problem is the main thing. So if you are not comfortable with that, just open the chest, okay? Uh, there are various surgeries that you can do. You can do a lobectomy if you know an obvious pathology in that area, 
or you can even do a segmentectomy if the aspergilloma is very clearly defined and located in one segment then no need to lose all of the lung uh, you can do a segmentectomy or a wedge even a wedge if it's an obvious source of bleeding then even a wedge works very well but very rarely very rarely will you do a pneumonectomy in most of these scenarios i personally try to avoid pneumonectomies because these are already compromised patients and they are not going to do well with a huge resection but sometimes you are forced to if the pathology is very central and uh, you know you're not uh, doing well or we spoke about the bronchial sleeve resection if in that scenario if you had to go in and uh, you know salvage the situation then a pneumonectomy may be an answer but usually you try to do it uh, lo localized as little lung loss as possible uh, the important thing that i want to mention to you before you do surgery is that you must be very sure of the side of the bleed okay very often you might think that you have got the bleeding and you there's an obvious pathology on the ct scan and you've gone and done the uh, resection but actually the bleeding came from the other side so it's very important that you the bronchoscopy must be very carefully done at the time of the hemoptysis not afterwards at the time of the hemoptysis if they do the bronchoscopy that report is quite uh, is quite crucial to give you an idea of which side and which lobe is involved uh, just radiology is not the answer you must have a very good bronchoscopy report to give you an insight into what is the lobe that is bleeding very very important in fact whenever i do surgery for hemoptysis i will always explain to the patient that there is a possibility a small possibility but there is a possibility that the hemoptysis might recur because there might be changes on the other side so it is important to explain to the patient very very clearly before surgery okay so what's the morbidity or mortality of these procedures the morbidity or mortality happens because the patient is in hemodynamic instability that is why the first rule all literature has looked at it every paper that i went through the first thing they have said is stabilize the patient it's only when people jump in and try to do operative interventions or endobronchial interventions on a very sick patient that people end up with very bad results and people die so the hemodynamic instability is the first cause of morbidity and mortality and whenever you manage hemoptysis that is the first thing that you need to manage the second thing why morbidity or mortality happens is because of soiling of the contralateral lung so these philosophies cannot be lost on any young surgeon this is this is straight from literature it tells you why you get and then the third is of course impaired pulmonary reserve of the patient secondary to soiling of the normal lung you will lose vas uh, oxygenation and that is the reason why people die from hemoptysis so very very important to keep these three things in mind uh so acute life saving is immediate that is the first thing that should be done and if possible if possible try to defer the surgery for 2 to 3 weeks okay so save the patient's life sort out whatever is needed to be done stabilize the patient do whatever uh, else that you need to do start antibiotics start anti tuberculous therapy start anti fungals depending on whatever and then if you can defer then you defer it and if there's a definite anatomical target and the patient is physiologically fit then you talk about surgery and if you do this philosophy your morbidity and mortality goes down okay this is documented in the literature that this is the technique for making sure that your model it's very high risk surgery whatever you're doing so if you manage to do this then your morbidity and mortality from these things go down Uh, emergency surgery of course you have to go in chest trauma uh, pa uh, rupture secondary to swan gans any avm malformation which has ruptured you may be able to get away with uh, with the uh, embolization but the problem with avm is that usually there are multiple sources really multiple sources uh, you may not get one feeder vessel there will be many feeder vessels and embolization becomes difficult in that scenario so you might actually have to go in urgently and operate and of course in patients with trach tracheoarterial fistula uh, following tracheostomy very very critical situation very difficult to manage uh, in this patient 
Uh, I'm just going to show you quickly uh, uh, this case which I spoke to you about uh, because I was in the in a situation where I have access to uh, a very good anesthetist. The affected side is down, and the first thing you do is put in a DLT. Okay. So once I've done the DLT, I'm very happy. I have isolated the site. Then my anesthetist will go in and he, she put in a Fogarty into the uh, other lobes on that side. So we, we, we isolated all the normal lobes, okay? This was right upper lobe. So we isolated the bronchus intermediates. We isolated the left side. And then once we have done that, that is when I turn the patient to the, uh, you know, side up for surgery. Because uh, during surgery as well, you can soil the, you can soil the rest of the uh, lungs. So it's important. Uh, uh, sorry. And this particular case, because I was in a scenario where I could do it, I did it by the robot. But ideally, I would not talk a robot. Ideally, actually, I would go in and do it by by VAX. So VAX is the is a good preference. But if you are in an inexperienced center or if you are a young surgeon, please open the chest. Open the chest and get rid of the problem. Okay, save the patient's life. Don't faff around if you are a trainee or you're relatively new or with intermediate level of VAX. Don't pass up, okay? All right. Now, when we talk about surgery, it is important to talk about everything that's available to you. And this is one of the most interesting papers that you will come across. Uh, Professor Daliwal from PTI Chandigarh actually uh, read this paper and he has published this paper. This is called as the Daliwal Lung Exclusion Technique. And this is directly from his paper, okay? I'm quoting his paper. So what he does in his paper is he goes in either by an anterolateral thoracotomy or a J-shaped sternotomy. His philosophy is whenever you have massive hemoptysis secondary to, uh, secondary to uh, chronic inflammation like tuberculosis uh, and uh, other uh, uh, you know, chronic uh, conditions, then there is a lot of collateralization from the chest wall onto the lung and if you go in into the affected side and try to dissect out all of this lung of the chest wall you lose a lot of volume and so what he suggests is that he goes in either straight away into an anterolateral thoracotomy or a j sternotomy and gets into the hilum of the lung he gets into the hilum of the lung he identifies the pa Either he opens the pericardium and identifies the PA, or he stays extra pericardially and he ligates the PA. This is he's doing a pneumonectomy for these destroyed lungs. Okay, we're talking about these chronic destroyed lungs. And he's presented a series, I believe it's 18 to 20 patients. I may have got the number wrong, but uh, it's it's it, it is something worth looking into. So he identifies the PA and he ligates the PA and then he divides the bronchus and closes the bronchus. So what he has done, he's effectively excluded that bleeding lung from the main, main uh, airway. But what he also does is he keeps the pulmonary vein patent. He preserves the pulmonary vein patent. And so effectively the vascular, the arterial supply is coming to the lung from the chest wall and the venous drainage is happening from the pulmonary vein. And that way, the bleeding will not come to the opposite side. And in his series, he reports that these patients have actually, uh, you know, managed to survive many years after his surgery. So this is the J-sternotomy he's doing. He's just showing it. And he's getting into there. He's isolating the pulmonary artery and just tying it off. He is cut off, cut off the bronchus and he's sutured off the bronchus. And this is uh, anterior uh, thoracotomy. And again, he has done this and he has sutured here. You can see he has cut off the bronchus and he sutured the bronchus. So it is called as a physiological lung exclusion. Now, whenever this paper is presented, it is a very controversial paper. Okay. It is always discussed many, many a times. And according to his personal series, he seems to have had good results and he seems to have had no recurrence of uh, hemoptysis and the lung which he has left behind seems to have stayed as it is. Uh, that is not the experience of anybody else in the world. There are other people who have done this surgery 
and most of the times you might solve the acute uh, hemoptysis but that bag of pus that you leave behind in the left chest continues to cause problems for uh, these patients they can get acutely infected they can be systemic sepsis they don't uh, you know this thing but his paper is worth reading i personally have actually operated on a few of his patients who have had lung exclusion surgeries in the past so acutely he got over the problem he, he the patient went home and probably didn't follow up with him because they came to us and i had to go in and actually do a pneumonectomy for this residual bag of pus that is left behind so there is pros and cons to it it's a very very innovative thinking and i i like is a thought process uh, and i'm pretty certain some patients must have benefited with this but uh, i have as i told you had to solve the problems for some of these patients and uh, akif turna uh, uh, reports his experience and he says he's done three of them and two of them died because of problems with the residual lung so not uh, the uptake in the rest of the world is not so good for this technology but it is something that you must be aware of okay uh, other things uh, uh, is uh, there's reported uh, reports from india of pulmonologists uh, going in there and causing what is called as a medical pneumonectomy so what is a medical pneumonectomy they go in and embolize the pulmonary artery with coils they just bang 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 get the whole pa on that affected side we are talking about uh, about full lung destruction okay who are presenting with the hemoptysis so they go in and embolize the pa completely on that side and then go in endobronchially and block that main bronchus with the fibrin or a cyanoacrylate glue uh, again uh, at best this can be called experimental it does solve the problem acutely but i'll tell you when these people come up for surgery in a subsequent stage or whenever they have recurrence we have huge problems with coils in the pa and cyanoacrylate glue in the bronchus i have actually solved some of these patients they have come to me for a second surgery and uh, it's a nightmare when you've got embolized when you've got coils in the main pa and you have got uh, cyanoacrylate glue in the there is in in the main bronchus it's so difficult to actually uh, staple a bronchus like this uh, many a times i've had to actually open up that bronchus and take away all of this uh, thing and hand sew the bronchus and then put a muscle pedicle on top of it so yes these techniques are available but you've got to be careful that you 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 deploy them uh, sensibly Uh, thinking about what is going to happen down the road to these patients so i i am always worried when i've got an aggressive pulmonologist who talks about doing anything like this because surgery is an option available for these patients you can try uh, bronchio bronchial artery embolization that i'm okay with but um, but to embolize the main pa and to block the main uh, bronchus with uh, cyanoacrylate glue is worse than fibrin so it really causes a huge plug there which doesn't go well with surgery and uh, so i am a little worried about it but this is there out there published papers a peer reviewed and published papers so whether you take it or not that's your your take on this other other uh, treatments that have been spoken about are radiotherapy uh, for fungal ball particularly in the older days of radiotherapy when we used to give broad spectrum radiotherapy this used to work uh, this was one of the therapies available but now with surgery becoming relatively safe uh, you know i cannot imagine a situation where you're giving radiotherapy to a fungal ball it might temporize the bleeding at that moment but uh, you've got to be uh, you know treatment uh, better treatments are available uh, there are papers which have published which have spoken about intra cavitatory use of sodium and potassium iodide again this is purely for completion sake i put all these treatments uh, so these are if somebody keeps digging you and asking you for more and more and speak about these therapies these are not standard therapies now uh, and and uh, you know this intra cavitatory thing can be done via an endobronchial technique uh, to push in sodium and potassium iodide into the cavity uh, 
I, I personally have never seen a patient like this. I've never seen what are the outcomes. Uh, so I would be a little hesitant when somebody talks about this. Hence, I use the word innovative techniques. So what is the mortality? Uh, the mortality is important to understand. If it has got a massive hemoptysis, more than a liter a day, then the more than 50% mortality. That is what is reported in literature. So it, this is not a, not a simple situation. These people die, okay? But if it's a less than a liter over 24 hours, then it's about 10%. So it is very important to temporize these patients, get control of the, of the bleeding. And of course, if it's cancer, then uh, there is very high mortality. 60 to 80% if it's a malignant uh, thing causing uh, blood loss of more than one liter over 24 hours. These are the numbers quoted out there in this case. So important to understand these pictures. So now I'm going to take, uh, uh, in necrotizing pneumonia lung abscess, the figures are pretty low, less than 1% because of most of these respond well to the treatments that we have. Okay, so I'm going to take you through a flow chart. This is Akif Turna's flow chart, which, we, which is actually written off in the ESTS textbook. Akif has written a beautiful flow chart. And I'll try and take you through this flow chart. This is a summary of everything that I've spoken so far, but in a systematic way. I like this summarization. So just listen to the next few slides. Uh, it, it will summarize the whole talk in a very systematic way. So I say this is for massive hemoptysis. Okay, so this is management for massive. So this is how it is published in the ESTS textbook, and I will go through it uh, piece by piece. So whenever you have massive hemoptysis. The most important thing is what you do first, okay? The conservative management is very important. Get the patient into bed rest, oxygenate the patient, start antibiotic if required, give any hemostatic agent, transanamic acid, whatever you want to give. You might have to sedate the patient to reduce the cough impulse. You have to put the patient's semi fowler position or the affected side down, okay? And make sure you've got good venous and arterial line. These are first line of management. This is what I want you to say in an exam, okay? This is what I would do in an exam. Then you look at the situation. If the hemoptysis has stopped, then you have option of doing uh, flexible and rigid bronchoscopy in this patient. Localize the source. Look if it is suitable for resection or not. Make an assessment on table, okay? And if it is suitable for resection, you know it's a localized right upper lobe lesion just offer him for surgery you know don't don't uh, half around surgery will actually take care of the whole situation because now the bleeding has stopped the patient has stabilized and he may be fit enough for surgery so that's one line of thinking okay in that situation uh if uh, if you could not find the source on on uh, on your flexible and rigid bronchoscopy then go into the angiography suite and look for embolization so again, I want to repeat this. If once you've stabilized the patient, if the bleeding is stopped, on bronchoscopy, you try to localize the source. If you know that it is suitable for resection, patient is fit enough, surgery is the option. If you cannot find the source, then ask for an angiography and do a bronchial, bronchial artery embolization. Okay, so that's the second situation. The third situation is when the bleeding is continued. You've done your conservative management, but the patient is continuing to bleed and he's at risk. So you need to get into the OR, you need to get rigid and flexible bronchoscopy on site. And then you have to think of endobronchial interventions because now your philosophy is to prevent the normal side being affected. So you make those calls. So it's called as pulmonary separation. Okay, so you decide what you want to do. And then after that, if the patient is suitable for resection and physiologically fit, then you can have definitive surgical treatment on the table, okay? So this is one line. The other option is you do the endobronchial intervention and you do the pulmonary separation, but he is not fit for surgery. He's not the guy where you want to go in and do a lung resection, but he is suitable for some medical therapy. Then you go in and do angiography, do your BAE, embolize the thing and offer him uh, offer him the medical treatment. So this could be tuberculous treatment, could be aspergilloma treatment, antifungals, whatever you want need to give. And that may solve the problem. And if it doesn't solve the problem, then surgery is of course available. 
So you stabilize the guy, send him away for a couple of months and bring him back. And if he's getting recurrent hemoptysis, then you have the option of surgery in future. So this is a synopsis of how you manage this. And this is what I want you to say in the exam. Okay. All right. Uh, two, two sources of information. Uh, one is uh, the ESTS textbook. ESTS textbook has written a beautiful chapter on this, on hemoptysis. Uh, Akif actually has written this chapter. I was actually going to ask Akif to do this talk, uh, but I think uh, I, I, I couldn't get his date. But uh, uh, that's one. And the other one is your uh, small textbook of uh, key topics in thoracic surgery. That's written by by Martin, and uh, Martin has done a good job uh, by describing the various management sources. Okay, thank you very much, guys. I'm going to stop sh sharing, uh, and uh, you can then ask me questions. This is a straightforward topic, nothing complicated about this, but it is something that turns up in the exam, and it is something that you must have a game plan of how you're going to talk. So three philosophies, that's the only important thing. Stabilize the patient, pulmonary separation, and stop bleeding. This is what I want to get across to you guys. I want you to understand these three philosophies. Once you have this in your mind in this sequence, then any question can be answered and there's no problems about various techniques that you use for getting control of these things. Thank you. Okay. Anybody wants to take questions? Yeah, there are a lot of questions today. Uh, because this is just me on here, uh, you can happily uh, switch on one by one and we can how we do other times uh, if somebody wants to take a question just switch on your mic and come in and ask me a question anybody wants to ask question nobody wants to ask question okay sir how will we know how will we know this is vikas here sir vikas here sir no sound i don't know why because uh, I don't know what is the problem. There is no sound. I can't hear you. Am I audible, sir? Oh, yeah, my volume. My volume is down to zero. Apologies. Yeah, because come in. Okay. How do we know which side is bleeding, sir, before uh, endoscopy to keep it down? Uh, radiology. Radiology will give you an idea. Uh, you know, if you've got an obvious lesion on the affected okay. side, the chest X-ray or a CT scan will give you. This. Chest X-ray is very good. So, radiology will help you find out which is the obvious. You could get it wrong, but 99% uh, of the times you'll be okay to know radiology. So, chest X-ray will give you an idea where the pathology is, and also look for uh, the flush. There will be a flush of pulmonary infiltration on the chest X-ray. And that will tell you which side. So you, you just turn the side down. But that will be in a sedated patient, right? No, no. Even in an awake patient, you can turn the patient to the right side and let him lie right side down if it's a right. Okay. This is just acute situation. He's talking about before you've done bronchoscopy. Yes. Yeah. Sir. Good evening, sir. Par Solanki here. Yeah, hi, Par. Tell me. Hello, sir. Sir, uh, I want to ask... Uh, Question for the same scenario. Uh, when we do x-ray in such a patient, in emergency, we, we want to know which side is been affected mm -hmm. to kill the patient to that side so that the opposite lung doesn't get soiled. Yeah. But uh, as uh, we know, that 10 to 30% of x-ray are normal, sir. In, yeah. in that scenario, how can we know that to which <laughs> then side? You then you don't kill the patient. You wait till you do bronchoscopy. Okay. Or you do Thank a CT scan. If the first thing is stabilize the patient. So turning to the side is not the first philosophy. First is stabilize the patient. I get to large bore, IV cannulas and whatever else. And uh, you know, if, if I am in an acute emergency, I block the CT scan uh, room and it takes me under five minutes to get a CT scan done from A&E to the CT scan and back is under five minutes. So you stabilize the patient hemodynamically, put in whatever else you want to do. Chest X-ray is done immediately in the A&E. And then if you're not sure what you're seeing or where you're seeing it, then just put him through the scanner. But hemodynamically stabilize the guy. That's the most important thing. So okay. Thank you, sir. Thanks not a lot, sir.
Sir, can you do a CT scan while the patient is still having hemoptysis? Like if the patient in a scenario where the patient is no, continuously no, coughing. Analyze the patient, start IV fluids, start the tranexamic acid, whatever you want to do. These, the hemoptysis is not as if it comes, it comes in bursts. You see, there are, there are periods yes. in the hemoptysis and then in between you might be able to scan him. It, it just depends on the situation. But uh, you're right, it, it, you may not be able to do a CT scan, but the problem is it's better to do a scan uh, then to rush into theater and then try to decide to do something. So uh, very often, uh, most of the times that I have been faced with this situation, I have actually managed to do the scan. Okay. Uh, so is there any role of uh, ECMO or cardiopulmonary bypass in massive hemoptysis? That is all advanced management. That is beyond... Uh, if, I mean, I, I have never had to put a guy on ECMO. Personally, I have never had to put about the problem with putting people on ECMO and things like that is that you have to heparinize the guy for the ECMO to work and that can make the bleeding worse. So I have personally never had to heparinize. Most of the times I've gone into theater. But uh, obviously, I mean, ECMO is an option available, but I, I, it's not a usual option for hemoptysis. It's not a usual option. It's a very rare case. I've not read in literature that somebody has used an ECMO. They may have, I'm not denying it, but certainly not read in published literature that somebody had to use an ECMO to solve hemoptysis. Uh, sir, Abhijit here. Yeah, Abhijit. Uh, so taking these patients for either pneumonectomies or lobectomies uh, with history of uh, modern massive hemoptysis and without history, will there be any change in your uh, strategies intraoperatively while operating these patients? In, in terms of what? I'm not sure. uh, in terms of dissection, what would you deal uh, first? What would you deal later to avoid any my, my, Okay. My philosophy in this situation is to just get in and get the first structure. There is no such thing as vein artery, bronchus. Or you want to do a lobectomy in the shortest possible time. Okay, that is what you want to do. So time is the most important thing. So if, if you can get to the pulmonary vein, just block it. Um, if you can get to the bronchus, just block it. Whichever gets you in first, there is no sequence. There is no suggestion that uh, doing an artery first will stop the bleeding more than doing the vein. There is very little evidence for that. We just get in whatever structure you can get in, you get in. But key of all of this is it should be the shortest surgery, surgical time. These are sick people and you've got to really get on with it, not waste time. So there is no order, preference or order of whether you should get vein, artery and bronchus. I know I understand logically thinking it makes sense, but uh, you may not get to the bronchus every time or you may not get to the vein every time. You just get in there and get that structure up. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, Dr. Jameer, I am Dr. Rajkumar. Yadav. Sir, namaskar, namaskar. How are you, sir? Sir, sir. I yeah. was looking for you yesterday on the I... lecture, sir, for comments. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you you are the most you. experienced person to I tell us about hemoptysis. Tell us, sir. I just congratulate you. You have got tremendous knowledge and uh, amazing speaker. You know, I've seen so far in uh, the, no, sir, yes, sir. Thank all you of the society. Tell me, sir. One, Please uh, tell the students I a little bit about your management. Any management, what uh, you suggested, but I just put my one experience. Oh, in one case, I was doing a uh, pneumonectomy for hemoptysis, okay. and in the middle of the Sergi, there was a massive intrapulmonary bleed and the, the saturation went down to uh, 30% uh, and uh, so we just uh, abandoned the surgery and uh, we just closed it off the and we did the dissection part was almost over means we did the apicolysis and uh, and with that apicolysis that patient survived uh, after because we needed some ventilation for a day or so but uh, later he never had the bleed again and uh, he is coming to me for follow-up since last five years oh, he did not have any uh, hemoptysis now okay. so i just uh, want to ask you that with, with this this uh apicolysis of a tubercular cavity helps some way in uh, 
controlling the bleeding uh, as well. Yeah, I, I think your patient's source of bleeding was the collaterals from the chest okay. wall. I think that was the source of bleed, and you actually got to the collateral yeah, the, disconnected. Yeah, the yeah. There, there, you know, so the, these adhesions were not that vascular adhesions. They were fibrous, more of the fibrous and calcified uh, um, parietal um, uh, adhesions. No, much vascular adhesions were there in case, that case. It was a tubercular cavity that had the recurrent hemoptysis. For mm -hmm. that, I took him for the OT to have a upper lobectomy or a pneumonectomy. Also, but in the middle of surgery, he had a massive bleed. Also, massive could bleed be, to the extent that I abandoned. Yeah. Could be that you actually isolated the lung. You gave him single lung yeah, ventilation. Yeah. And the collapse of the single lung might have clotted off whatever was the source of bleeding. We don't know, sir, but I'm just guessing this. But for youngsters on this forum, yeah. I would say that if you get into the chest, first get into the island. Uh, you know, you will lose a lot of volume trying to take it down from the chest wall. So my philosophy <laughs> when I am in it, this it, 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 in, the, in the tubercular lung, it takes a lot of time to reach to the hilum. You know, that is the, the periphery. Oh, 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 oh. Of course, sir. Of course, yeah. I agree with you. The, uh, my, my personal experience with this has been going by VATS. And with VATS, sir, I managed to get to the hilum faster than I would do with an open thoracotomy. Okay. Because with thoracotomy, you yeah. have to dissect the peripheral adhesions. With VATS, we just direct the whole camera under vision into the hilum. And so we move into the hilum right. much faster than we do with the open thoracotomy. So yeah. that is one of my philosophies why I go in by minimally invasive. Yeah. Because under vision, I can get to the hilum much faster. I don't take out the chest wall. I do that as the last part of the procedure. But the, in you know, open surgery, it is not possible to go to the hilum. No, it is not possible. I agree, with you. I agree with you. In open surgery, right. it's much more difficult to get to the You have to dissect the chest wall off. Right, right. Good to see you, sir. So thanks a lot. Uh, we enjoy your uh, talks now. <laughs> yes, very kind, sir. And in the corona, we're sitting free. All right, good, sir. Good to see that. Right. Any more questions, guys? No. Anybody's got any more questions? Hello, sir. Yeah, hi. Who's that? Oh, sir, this Please, is Sudhir from Bangalore. Hello? Yeah, who's that? Sir, this is Sudhir from Bangalore. Yeah, hi, Sudhir. Sir, uh, I have two questions. Yeah. Uh, one, in... Uh, Cardiac causes of hemoptysis like mitral stenosis and pulmonary thromboembolism with infarcts. What is the role of bronchoscopy and endobronchial interventions? Uh, no, the endobronchial interventions uh, only stop at if it's a massive hemoptysis, then you would do uh, bronchoscopy and do any endobronchial intervention to prevent soiling. So you just want to leave a spigot or something. But the real treatment is cardiac. Okay. Endobronchial is not the treatment. Endobronchial, okay, you don't get in there. The real treatment is treat the cardiac cause of the bronchitis, of the hemoptysis. Okay, sir. And so my second bronchoscopy question... Bronchoscopy is not, doesn't have a big role in that. Only thing okay. is when you have got an acute situation, you just try to buy time. Okay, sir. Uh, my second question, sir. Uh, in case of lung infarct, like after pulmonary embolism, uh, with hemoptysis, and patient has been stabilized for two to three weeks, there is no hemoptysis again. Mm -hmm. uh, we are planning for a surgery under a deep hypothermic circulatory arrest. So chances of uh, him getting again hemoptysis after surgery and is there anything like heparin challenge test? Uh, we give heparin and uh, check whether he is having any hemoptysis before surgery. Is there anything like that? The, the answer is no actually. Uh, don't think that anybody has looked at it from that way uh, whether heparin challenge test can be done. Uh, the problem with the infarction and all that is you give a heparin, you may not reproduce that hemoptysis at that time. And okay. uh, in future, he might have hemoptysis. So I don't think I've come across any literature which speaks about a heparin challenge test for uh, reproducing a hemoptysis. It's a very, very random occurrence. The problem is very often you don't know when it's going to happen. And even worse, you don't know from where it's going to happen. This is a real, it's like a ticking time bomb. And uh, as clinicians, all of us struggle with this question, which you just asked. 
when to know that this guy will bleed or when to know it will not bleed. Now, Dr. Rajkumar Yadav just told us about his patient where he went in and came out and, and the bleeding stopped. So, you know, it's a very, it's not an exact science. Okay, thank you, sir. Thanks, thanks. Any other questions? Anybody else wants to ask any questions? Let me just look at these questions. How do you know which side is bleeding? Okay, we've done that. Uh, somebody wants to know about massive hemoptysis for chest trauma or road traffic accidents and uh, fall from high. Uh, good evening, Samia. That's me, Dr. Adrian. Hey, Adrian, how, how are, are you? you? Hey, good to see you. What are you doing? It must be 2 o'clock in the night. <laughs> I cannot oh. miss your excellent lecture, you know. Oh my God! <laughs> so I, I, I think I think I think the training may benefit about some 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 management for for this uh, road traffic accidents or massive chest traumas or falls from height. Yeah, sometimes absolutely. they may not be salvageable, but at least to give them some hint or clue or how how to hand, handle this situation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, why don't you tell us, Adrian? You're the you're the expert in this. <laughs> I, I, I'm I'm falling asleep now. Yeah. Oh. All right. Well, uh, for the residents, the first principle of any yeah. trauma is ATLS. Okay, ATLS principles, and it's got to be A, B, C, D, E. There is no shortcut to this. You have to resuscitate these patients. Very, very, very important. So most of the times with trauma, my first uh, thing is get the airway secure. If he needs to be intubated, so be it. You intubate the guy. Uh, make sure the breathing is uh, is well maintained. You might we need you might need to oxygenate him on a high FiO2. Uh, you have to get large bore uh, cannulas or even a central line uh, to get uh, adequate fluid resuscitation. Uh, you might have to give blood transfusion. And I, I will start off with just first putting in a chest tube. So I put in a chest tube and I see what's happening. And if suddenly I find bang, a whole lot of blood comes in, I'll clamp the tube. And once I've resuscitated the guy, I actually go to theater. I have actually opened a chest even without a CT scan when I, I knew that there was, a, this, was a, uh, this was actually a gunshot injury with massive hemoptysis. And I have taken the guy to theater and opened the chest purely because there was no time to do anything else. And uh, the moment I put in a chest tube, I, I got a liter, liter and a half out. And uh, so you just clamp the chest tube, take him into theater, turn him on the side and do a thoracotomy and get in there. Uh, but first philosophy is always airway breathing circulation, repeatedly airway breathing circulation. Then you can do radiology. If you manage to do radiology, that's good. Ideal is to do radiology so that you know exactly what you're dealing with. Uh, most of the bleedings uh, usually stop. If it is a bleeding from a major, the thing you have to remember with the, with pulmonary artery or aortic injuries is that uh, uh, more than 50% of them die on the spot of the accident. So the guys who reach you probably have, uh, you know, uh, already given them a chance uh, to, to their own self because uh, the, the, it, it wasn't an exsanguinating situation. Um, if it is uh, aortic injuries, uh, when I do CT scans, I always ask them to do uh, aortic angiograms as well at the same time. I want shots of the aorta to see if there is any aortic injury. Uh, most aortic injuries nowadays are managed with endovascular stenting. Uh, very rarely do you have to actually open and operate. So aortic injuries, most of the times endovascular stenting. Uh, respiratory injuries, uh, unless it is an exsanguinating injury, most of the times this huge amount of pulmonary contusion and hematoma that you get usually settles with time. If you go in, then it is all salvaged. Then it completely depends on what you find in there. Again, the mortality rate of these patients is more than 50 to 60%. So 50% die on the site of the accident. The remaining 50% when they come to you, the mortality rate is more than 50% when you have to open the chest. It is all salvage situation. Then it depends on what you see inside. Uh, so that, that is the philosophy, but always ABC, always ABC first. Excuse thank you, me, thank you, Professor Khan. Thank you. Thanks, Adrian. Excuse me, sir. Adrian's a good buddy. <laughs> Old friends. Tell me, next question. Uh, sir, 
you said you would clamp the chest tube yeah yeah when you have, that is only in an acute situation where everything is just flowing out and you don't know what the hell to do and you are about to go to theater just clamp the tube get in there open the chest that, that is one good thing sir that's normal normal thing sorry sir that whole like temporary act as a yeah, tampon yeah, you just the you don't want to lose the whole blood the patient will die before yeah. you go to the operating table yes. exactly exactly sir okay. the patient will exactly. die before you if you put in a chest tube and suddenly it starts exsanguinating then then you have no time at all the patient will die so you clamp it and take him to theater and open the chest this is very rare scenarios i have i have been at least probably two or three times in this situation here, which adrian is just yeah. one thing i wanted to add sir yeah who's that sudhir sir yeah hi sudhir uh good evening sir <clears throat> can that blood be hepatized and uh, uh, auto transfusion can be done with uh, those uh, <sighs> Uh, if you've got clean uh, cut, uh, stab, uh, gunshot injury, these are all infected situations. So if your if your blood uh, blood uh, what do you call it the blood transfusion unit can supply you with transfusion, it's better to use transfused blood rather than that blood. Mm -hmm. uh, we do use. Uh, uh, we do use uh, suctions uh, the auto saver auto transfusions i have used it in some situations but most of the times that has been in an acute injury on table so like i was operating and i damaged the main pa and suddenly i've got a 5 liter blood i'm quite happy to suck it into the cell saver and use it again but in trauma and things like that usually this is all infected situation oh, but you have to do what you have to do in that uh, situation if you got got not if you got no blood in the blood transfusion then better to give the patient's own blood yeah you need a cell saver setup they, it is not uh, available they, in every unit only cardiac units will have it there is a practice people practice this that uh, they connect that chest tube to a bag and the ba blood in the bag they hepatize and uh, transfuse it immediately then and there itself in the emergency itself uh, yeah. no, it, no, um, it yeah. could be done in in a smaller yeah. center it was uh, uh, yeah. personally i have worked in centers where blood is available i, I don't do things like that it, it takes can. time in these patients to even uh, match the group and uh, getting a o negative blood group yeah i suppose you have to do what you have to do in your given situation so if if you if you think that that is the way forward yeah please go ahead and do it but i i, I don't think that uh, these guys are going to die <laughs> anyways the mortality is so high uh, you 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 got to be sensible about what you do I, i mean you could do it i i really don't know the answer to that thanks thanks yeah any more questions are you happy okay thank you very much guys uh, good news is that i have managed to speak let me stop recording first so that uh, this gets